Ford rent. Hello. <laughs> kind of like the old Chevy Chase. I don't know if you ever, uh, too, too long on Saturday Night Live where he'd be making faces and stuff and then the camera would go on. Anyway, um, the war is over uh, uh, very quickly with the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, thereby concluding the war in the Pacific a few months after the war in, uh, in Europe had ended. Uh, uh, and quite often you will hear in history that fighting a war is kind of the easy part and what happens afterward is much more difficult. Clearly what you're seeing in Iraq today is, is a good testimony uh, to that. Once the war ends, this grand alliance of the Americans and the British and the, uh, uh, the Soviet Union uh, has hopes of uh, continuing into the post-war era. They got along well. There was a, a cooperation, you know, this, this, this uh, joint struggle uh, against this horrible, evil Nazi foe. So obviously everybody is optimistic that, that can continue into the post-war era. It doesn't. Instead, you go from World War II to uh, what uh, historically we refer to as the Cold War. Okay, why do we call it the Cold War? What does that mean? What is the Cold War? No shooting. No shooting. It's a Cold War, which is really a misnomer, but unlike a hot war, hot war is when you're actually killing each other in a Cold War. It's not necessarily a war of shooting. A, uh, it's a war of politics, of economics, clearly a war of competition. In this case, what's the Cold War about? Who's it between? Who are the combatants? Who are the adversaries? in the Cold War that we refer to after 1945. The Soviet Union and the Americans, communism and freedom, right? Freedom and slavery. I mean, it's put in these very stark terms. So it, it's a war. Now, it will become a shooting war. It becomes a shooting war in Asia. It becomes a shooting war via proxy armies, all right? It becomes an incredibly expensive war. It's a war of competition. It's a war of extending one's influence, of extending one's uh, control, influence, and hegemony over other areas. But it's a cold war because the U.S. and Soviet Union never come to battle. They never, they never come to blow, so we refer to it as a Cold War. Um, the Cold War was born in uh, the war itself and the way the war was fought, and so there are several wartime factors. Uh, uh, we've talked about a few of them. I'm not going to put all of them up there. Uh, the Italian surrender I didn't really mention, but what had happened was, although there was a policy of unconditional surrender, in fact, the Italians were able to surrender with conditions. But what's really important is that the Americans and the British especially the Americans negotiated the surrender of Italy in 1943. Who didn't negotiate the surrender of Italy, who wasn't in on the negotiations? The Soviet Union wasn't. Why is that important? They were allies, right? So Stalin always saw that as kind of a sign of distrust. But even more important were the second front, which we've talked about, the delay in the second front, and the use of the atomic bomb, which Stalin thought was pr provocative. Overall, as I said, the Second Front was important, but also the general sense of Soviet uh, uh, contribution was really critical. Uh, by the end of the war, the Red Army, as I said, was responsible for over 80% of the Germans killed uh, and for the German retreat through Eastern Europe into Berlin in, in 45. Uh, the Soviet had huge losses, 25, maybe 50 million, between 20 and 40% of their entire population. Massive civilian casualties. When the Germans invaded in 41, uh, Hitler believes that Slavs are really no better than Jews. So even though native populations actually were willing to, to accept the Nazis. The, the, the uh, uh, German army often went on you know, rampages of killing, raping, and so forth. Um, uh, so the Soviet Union lost huge numbers of people there, huge civilian losses. 70,000 Russian villages and over a million farms and factories were destroyed. Over 40,000 miles of railway track was demolished. Soviet production as a result of the war broke down during the war with grain harvest dropping by a half and industrial output down by a third even with the incredible output of tanks. So basically almost all industry was, was uh, directed toward uh, uh, military needs. So all of these factors create grave concerns, to put it gently, uh, when, the war be, uh, when the war is over. And so the war ends and essentially the acrimony uh, 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 begins. The post-war alliance doesn't last very long. You know, you can see already in the war that there are roots of this acrimony in the second front and the bombing and the great losses. And um, it's going to continue and get worse then. The first sign uh, 
the first time they get together that, that, that there will be different goals and visions occurs while the war is still in progress. There's a major conference, which I mentioned earlier, at Yalta in February 45. Okay? Um, post-war, these hopes for post-war friendship basically were illusory. Um, and uh, uh, the big three, as they're known, Churchill, Stalin, and um, Roosevelt, um, get together at Yalta, which is in the Crimea, in uh, 1945. And uh, there's a little-known fact about Yalta, which you don't know if you want to go to that. Uh, but you can see that, you know, actually I was there briefly. You know, Churchill couldn't make it, so. <laughs> Ah, uh, Photoshop, isn't that great? Oops. Anyway, anything for a cheap laugh, right? So they get together at Yalta, and basically they're going to talk about the post-war world. What do we do? The war's over. Now what are we going to do? Um, they all have, once again, different ideas. They want to prepare for the post-war world, but they have different goals. The United, and, and, and there are a couple major issues, Poland and Germany. We're going to talk a lot about Poland and Germany. Uh, what does the U.S. want to do at Yalta? First, it wants a non-communist Polish state. Now, remember we talked earlier, when the, when the uh, Red Army goes through Eastern Europe and liberates Eastern Europe, uh, what do they do? They leave their armies there, right? So when Poland is liberated, the Red Army stays in Poland. All right. So the United States wants to make sure that Poland isn't a communist country. Why does the U.S. care about Poland all that much? The worst thing about Poland, but there's another reason, not quite as uh, lofty, let's say. It's near Russia, it's a buffer, and then even, let's be a little even more kind of base. Uh, are there a lot of Poles in the United States? <laughs> are, there, are there a lot of Poles in the U.S.? There, it's, it's a huge ethnic group that overwhelmingly votes for the Democratic Party. There are actually more polls in Chicago than in Warsaw. So uh, Roosevelt is also concerned about maintaining his constituency for the Democratic Party. So he wants to you know, make sure that the Polish people in the United States uh, are, are not unhappy with the Democratic Party. So he wants to make sure that Poland is kept out of communist hands. What, what's the major religion in Poland as well? You should all know that Catholicism, right? And what do Catholics think of communism? Obviously not much, because during the war they supported, you know, Franco, Mussolini, and Hitler. You know, the, the Vatican was on good terms with all of them. So uh, the, the Catholic world always saw communism as, as a far graver danger. So uh, Roosevelt, uh, uh, for lots of reasons, strategic in Europe, as well as uh, pressure from Poles, Polish Americans and Catholics in the U.S., wants to maintain a, a non-communist Poland. Roosevelt wants Soviet entry into the war. There's a big debate, and to go back briefly to the atomic bomb issue, as to whether uh, this would have happened had Roosevelt lived. And so there are a lot of people, kind of Roosevelt fans, who say, oh, if he hadn't died, none of this would have happened. Uh, in fact, I'll argue Roosevelt wanted the Soviet Union to get into the war against Japan. Uh, I think in February of 1945 it would have been folly not to want the Soviet Union to come into the war against Japan. You don't know what's going to happen, you know. I mean, granted, you know, your, your planners are saying they're probably going to surrender, but as a contingency, if they don't, you know, you clearly, you know, you don't know if the atomic bomb is going to work in February of 45. You really don't know if the atomic bomb is going to work in February of 45. It's not tested until July. So wanting the USSR into the war doesn't by itself offer prima facie evidence that Roosevelt was somehow conciliatory. Roosevelt did think that his personal relationship with Stalin was, was, was good. I mean, Roosevelt was a charming, seductive man. He called Stalin Uncle Joe. They laughed and joked. They slapped each other on the back. You know, they, they made fun of Churchill together. Um, they walk, you know, well, they, never mind. I'm just going to get in trouble like I did with that Reagan thing last week. I'm going to catch myself now. All right, so this is what Roosevelt wants. And Roosevelt also wants to create a United Nations. So, that's what the U.S. want. What does the Soviet Union want? They want Poland to be what kind of country? Communist. They want a communist Poland. The U.S. wants a non-communist Poland. Importantly, more importantly from the Soviet point of view, what do they want? They want Germany to be what? Weakened, hurt, right? Just like World War I. They want Germany crushed. And they want reparations to be heavy. Heavy. 
because they want paid. They want payback, right? So this is the Soviet Union. Soviet Union kind of has these kind of World War I, it's kind of the World War I uh, 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 questions, right? We want Germany wiped out and we want reparations to make up for what we've lost because the devastation really was dramatic. What do the, what do the British want? What does Churchill want? Churchill wants, as always, to preserve as much of the British Empire as possible. He wants to keep the Soviet Union's influence in Poland limited. And he wants to, and we'll get to this later, bring France in again as a player in European politics. Remember the French cave, they buckled uh, in 40, but Churchill wants to kind of resuscitate uh, the French as a powerful country. Um, at Yalta, the most divisive issue was Poland. There were two groups at Pol uh, there were two groups com claiming power in Poland, uh, kind of alliterative there. Uh, there was a group in Lublin, which is in Poland, of communists. And they were established by the Red Army, more or less, as the official government of Poland, the Lublin communist Poles. But there was an exile group of old Polish leaders in London. Now Churchill and Roosevelt wanted the London Poles to be in charge because they were anti-communist and the Soviet Union wanted the Lublin Poles to be in charge because they were communist. Who has the advantage here? Russia. Lublin. Yeah, they're on the ground. They're there, right? So they remain to occupy Poland. So the best that Roosevelt can come up with as an agreement that says we shall have, quote, free and unfettered elections in Poland. Roosevelt's aide, Admiral uh, Leahy, says that language is so loose and elastic that you could stretch it all the way from D.C. back to Yalta and never break it. They have elections in Poland. Guess who wins? The Lublin Poles, the communists do. Stalin says, hey, you know, I did what you told me to do. I had elections, the Lublin Poles won, you got nothing to complain about. There's another good story, apparently, when they were negotiating and Roosevelt keeps saying, and what about Poland? What about human rights in Poland? What about Catholics in Poland? What about Poland? And finally Stalin draws on his pipe and looks back and says, Poland, what about Mississippi? You know, meaning like, don't lecture me about human rights when you treat blacks in the United States the way you do. The Soviet Union was always talking about civil rights in the U.S., talking about blacks and lynchings. They had a field day with that because it cuts through all this American rhetoric and, you know, hypocrisy about what a great beacon of human rights they were. You know, we're going to save the people of Poland and Stalin pointed out, you save the people of Poland, you look at the way you treat blacks in the United States. So, you know, just, you know, back off. And, 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 you know, and FDR basically, I think, is doing this principally because it's good for the domestics. It's good for the Polish Americans. It's good for the Catholics. They'll continue to vote for him because he's taken a hard line, right? Um, so uh, uh, later on, uh, this would be a major factor in a conservative attack on FDR. After FDR died, and you know, he was a hero. It was like JFK. Everybody loved FDR. But then a few years later, people start to reevaluate him. A lot of conservatives, well, conservatives always hated FDR. They thought he was a socialist. They thought he was a communist, a crazy radical. But they would say, at Yalta, FDR sold out Eastern Europe. Instead of making a stand, instead of sending the troops in, instead of telling Stalin to stay out, he simply said that Poland could be communist, you know? And again, the fact of the matter is the Red Army was there. You don't have to like them, you don't have to respect them, you don't have to think it was a good idea. But as a matter of fact, they got, you know, hundreds of thousands of soldiers and tanks and weapons, you know, uh, in, in the, there on the ground. Now, do you think American soldiers, finally, the war is over and they're thrilled and they're kissing women in Times Square and, you know, do you think they're, they're going to they're, they're gonna want to be told, you know, hey, time to remobilize, we're going to go fight for Poland now? I mean, no one's going to do that. You're going to fight a war with your ally? I mean, the Soviet Union and, America, and, and the Americans are allies, so um, it's, it's kind of a preposterous criticism. I mean, in a sense, FDR, and I'm not a, a huge fan of Roosevelt, but, but at the same time, he doesn't have a whole lot of options in this, so um, uh, Poland is considered a major blow. Now, conservatives and, and liberals, basically Americans, and there's a consensus on this, will see Poland as evidence of Stalin's overall design. See, uh, the real issue of the Cold War will be, uh, for the Americans, it will be Soviet adventurism, Soviet expansionism, Soviet aggression. The basic line will be that the Cold War was all Stalin's fault. Why? Because he wanted to take over the world. He was just a new Hitler. You had Hitler, now you got Stalin, right? And as evidence of that, look at Eastern Europe. Look at Eastern Europe.
right? Look at Poland. He kept his troops there and he put his own government in power. That proves it, right? So this is going to be evidence that Roosevelt sold out. And, and in addition to that, one of Roosevelt's aides at Yalta was a guy named Alger Hiss, who was later implicated in all kinds of spying and stuff like that. So this is part of the conservative attack that FDR sold out Eastern Europe, especially Poland, at Yalta. Germany's also a big issue too. And in Germany, the issue again, as after World War I, will be reintegration. What to do, what to do. Early on, the Americans, kind of like after World War I, wanted to crush Germany. They had a policy, what they called pastoralization, to basically deindustrialize all of Germany and just make them into a bunch of small farmers. So they couldn't cause any problems, they couldn't build weapons. However, as Woodrow Wilson and John Maynard Keynes had understood after World War I, Germany's economic revival was essential to the rebirth of the European economy and hence the global economy. And so you can crush Germany all you want, and that's clearly what the Soviet Union wants to do. But if you do that at the end of the day, you're, try you're, you're ultimately doing damage to this global system, this globalizing mission, which will come back and hurt you. All right? So again, reintegration becomes the, the, the preferred policy. Yeah. You know, I think they were always thinking of that, but I think in a sense it was more defensive because uh, uh, the Soviet Union is an incredibly weakened adversary. I mean, the two major powers are the U.S. and Soviet Union after World War II, but the disequilibrium is huge. So the Soviet Union can't really think aggressively and offensively. And, you know, I mean, I'm sure if they had the capacity to do that, they would. But basically their point is we want Germany you know, crushed basically to get payback for what they did to us in terms of reparations and also because we don't want to be invaded again. Uh, uh, if it hurts the U.S., that's even better. Sure, sure, sure. But at the same time, I mean, Stalin, Stalin, and I didn't spend a lot of time on him because I don't, you know, this isn't a course to do that and I'm not an expert in Soviet history, but I've read a bit about him and I know a little bit and, you know, uh, he's a brutal, bloody dictator. And hundreds of thousands, maybe more than that, people were actually killed, executed by him because he thought that they were out to get him. At the same time, he's a fairly intelligent guy. And he's very, very cautious and conservative. And there's no evidence, and we'll go through that. I'm going to spend a lot of time on that. There's no evidence there's, of, of Stalin ever acting precipitously, or Stalin acting aggressively, or Stalin not backing down when confronted. So he's not really in a position, I think, to kind of challenge the U.S. He understands that they have an overwhelming preponderance of power, and they're going to pretty much get their way. The main concern in 1945 and in the immediate Cold War years is actually going to be to preserve what he has. Eastern Europe is, is, is not up for negotiation as far as he's concerned. That's, right, that's true. He liberated it. That's foreign territory. That's alien, enemy territory. You know, people sweep through there and invade it. He's not giving it up. That's, that's just not even going to be negotiated. And the Americans know that. You know, the Americans know that. That's, you know, there's a big debate as to whether it's Stalin's fault, whether it's communist fault, or whether this is just traditionally the way Europeans act. I tend to think the, the, the latter is more likely. I mean, there have always been spheres of influence, and, and uh, 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 you know, and, and by no means would I sugarcoat Stalin. I mean, he was a very brutal and bloody dictator, but in terms of his foreign policy, he's actually pretty cautious, and it makes sense if you look at it from that perspective. You've just been invaded. You've lost how many tens of millions of people? Yeah, you want to make sure that the Germans don't ever do that again. You re and, and the French felt the same way. I mean, there's really, you know, the, the French and the, and, the, and the Russians are kind of on the same side uh, uh, on this. So um, the Americans agree on reintegration. Uh, so the dis the, and, and Russia wanted a dismemberment. It, it doesn't happen. We'll talk about it later. Germany is eventually split into four zones, and that actually doesn't take place till Potsdam. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 Russia doesn't get its way. I mean, they do get reparations. They will get something out of Germany, but but essentially, the, the West, the Allies, call the tune. Uh, Germany will be reintegrated, and the Allies will kind of get their way uh, uh, there. Uh, in addition to that. Um, at Yalta, Churchill insists and gets an agreement that France will be brought in to help in the occupation of Germany. Now, this is kind of blows a lot of people away because the French, remember, had, had been wiped out quite easily in early 1940. Uh, so uh, uh, to, to bring France in as a partner in the occupation of Germany strikes a lot of people as being you know, very, very strange. Uh, but uh, uh, Churchill believes that France can be a barrier to German expansion. 
Uh, Stalin didn't want the French in either. I mean, Stalin basically believed that the three major powers should should focus on and deal with Germany, the the, the British, the Americans, and and the Soviet Union. All right. So Stalin loses. France is brought in. It's cut into four. On the question of reparations, Stalin doesn't get his way either. Um, the Allies agreed that German payments would be in kind. Okay, uh, meaning that the Russians can take whatever they need out of Germany. They can take out, fa and they do, they take out factories and uh, raw materials that they don't have to, because after World War I, remember, it was set in dollars or pounds, and, and no one could ever pay it. So what the Russians are suggesting is they will take it uh, in kind, all right? Uh, but they don't agree on setting any amount, so that's still uh, up in the air, all right? So uh, Yalta uh, indicates that they are capable of working together. I mean, nobody like takes a swing at anybody else at Yalta, but at the same time, there clearly are issues which are divisive already and will become more so. And you can see that at Potsdam, which takes place in July. Um, Potsdam is outside of Berlin, and in July of 45, the war is over. At Yalta, it was in the final stages. At Potsdam, uh, Germany, again, is the major issue. Um, the Americans decide, and this isn't going to change now, that Germany has to reindustrialize, that it has to be reintegrated into the global political economy. As a result, Germany is split into four zones, and each of the four powers now, because the uh, uh, French are brought in on it, uh, is given a zone of occupation. All right, and you can kind of see down in the corner that the difference. This isn't the best map, but you can look at it on your own. All right, but the um, this is the Soviet zone. These are the Western zones. All right, um, Germany split into four zones. The Americans, the British, and the French get the western part of Germany. Uh, looking at it objectively, they got a much better deal because what's in western Germany? The Ruhr and the Saar, in all of German's industries. And what's in the east? Mostly agriculture. All right. In addition to that, the west treats those three zones as a single economic unit, so they're able to kind of coordinate economic activities in the western zones much better. The Soviet Union gets the eastern occupational zone. This is a hard pill for Stalin to swallow. As far as Stalin's concerned, he beat Germany. The Red Army beat Germany. And he's getting, I think objectively, the, the worst of, of the deal here. Um, Stalin uh, uh, was deeply concerned about reparations in Germany and really wanted to be able to rebuild based on what he could get out of Germany. Now, in the same way that reality, objective conditions, suggested that the US couldn't do anything about Poland, in the same way, there's not a whole lot Stalin can do about Germany. He doesn't have the capacity to, to force any kind of a settlement, so he essentially has to, to compensate. He accepts what the Allies give him, actually tears apart factories in Germany and brings them back to the Soviet Union and puts them uh, together uh, again. Um, but the Soviet Union could only take reparations from its own zone, which is really a problem because that was not the strongest economic zone. It was an agricultural zone with less industry, right? In addition to that, if it got reparations from the West, if it did get reparations from the Western zones, <clears throat> it would have to pay for them with agricultural commodities from the East. So it's not like they're getting anything. I mean, it really is part of a, a negotiated commercial system. Yeah? He's basically occupied 11 other countries and he's got Mm-hmm. But Germany's still far more powerful, and I think there's, you know, there, I mean, there's also political, uh, 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 and that would probably be the, that would be the West argument. But, you know, keep in mind, too, what's the state of the, what is the status of those countries he's occupied? They're, they've been devastated, right? They've been wiped out, so. Um, but, I mean, it, it, you know, he can complain about it all he wants, but, you know, in, in the real world, he understands the West can do this, and they will. Why can they do it? It's like Bill Clinton, you know? Why did he do it? Because he could, you know, so. Um, so by mid-45, by July of 45 then, you can see that this post-war arrangement is already on the rocks. 
I mean, you know, I, I think it's pretty clear at that point that the, 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 the alliance, the, the cooperation, the goodwill is gone, you know. I mean, the issue of Poland cannot help, but I'm sorry, Germany, the issue of Germany, Poland's important, but Germany is it. Germany is the issue, just like it was after World War I. The issue of Germany cannot help but be critically divisive because that's the guts of the post-war world. Whoever controls Germany essentially controls Germany. If Germany goes capitalist, then the West is in great shape. If Germany goes communist, which really is not even a possibility, then the West has suffered a major loss, okay? Uh, but it's also clear that Germany's not gonna go communist fairly early on, all right? So this is, is part of the, the post-war planning uh, at Yalta and Potsdam. But there are other strategies. Anybody any questions on this? There are other strategies for American hegemony too. And these actually take place, I'm kind of in, in inverse uh, chronological order right now. These actually take place uh, uh, while the war is still being fought. And they are economic and political, and I would argue they're, they're uh, vital. They're as important as anything that takes place in Europe. Okay? Uh, yeah? Did, uh, did Stalin go along with the, the foreign zones and the French come in primarily because there, there, there's a lot of influence there. Um, I've never seen it put in those terms. I mean, I, I don't think so, actually. Uh, uh, that's, I mean, I probably won't do much with that. That's really important. I mean, in, in all of the Western European countries, the war was so devastating that, in fact, uh, socialist and communist parties were, were actually quite popular in France, in Italy, in Greece. Uh, Britain had a labor government, a real labor government, unlike, you know, Tony Blair. Um, so, uh, uh, and the Soviet Union clearly is looking upon this with, uh, with hope and optimism, but at the same time, the links are not, you know, real easy to prove. I mean, there's, there's, the, the, there's, I'm not suggesting there's autonomy, but at the same time, these aren't really Soviet directed in the sense that, you know, they're, they're kind of working in, in conjunction. In addition to that, um, the United States is deeply involved in the British left, in the European left. I mean, they're sending the AFL and the CIO and the CIA. Uh, all of these people are, are flooding into Europe to try to, to uh, disrupt uh, so, uh, communist trade unions, socialist parties, and things like that. So Stalin, I mean, clearly he has hopes. It would be great, I'm sure, from his perspective, to have a, a socialist or a communist government. Well, not a socialist government really wouldn't be very friendly. I mean, the socialist, there's actually a very strong anti-communist thread throughout the European left. This gets really complicated. I don't spend a lot of time on it. But, uh, uh, so I don't think he really could count on that as being, you know, kind of a, a barrier to him. He didn't want the French in. You know, he didn't want the French in because uh, that, takes a cut from something he thought should be his. You know. So uh, uh, these two strategies, and I want to do that because I think they're very important, especially the first one. In um, the, the middle of 1944 and mid-44, uh, a group of nations get together at Bretton Woods in New Hampshire. And there they convene what they call the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference. Uh, by this time, everyone's pretty certain that the Allies will win. They, Germany and Japan are in, in trouble. So they're already thinking ahead, and, and they're, these are uh, guys who've been in power for a while, so they're very much aware of what had happened after World War I. What had happened after World War I in the 20s and 30s? What did Global depression, right? So they understand that and they want to create a system to avoid that again. Because this war is way bigger than World War I was, you know, bigger than the Great War was. And the same thing could happen, it could even be worse. So they want to create a system to stabilize the world's economy so that there would be no repeat of the global depressions and the currency fluctuations and, and everything else of the 20s and 30s which led to the Second World War. They want to establish a new world system and what do you think they want to establish this system on? What ideas, what economic ideas and organizations, what kind? Free trade. They want to trade, obviously, they want to establish, obviously, a world based on free trade and markets. Why? That will eliminate colonialism because remember the Americans are anti-colonial. Why? Because colonialism violates the open door. All right. In addition to that, they believe, as Cordell Hall said, remember that quote I read? In the end, the political lineup followed the economic lineup. They believe that free trade and commercial intercourse will create prosperity and peace. That countries that trade with each other will be less likely to fight against each other. Remember, you know, the main reason for World War II was that the Germans and the Japanese were trying to eliminate, to create a system that would shut off 
huge regions of the world to outside commerce, all right? Germany and Japan didn't respect the open door. So American officials especially, but others in the West, want to create a new system to give them access to markets, to raw materials, to labor, to investment. Right? It's, it's, we've been talking about this forever, right? We've talked a lot about globalization, you know, and I said at the very beginning, globalization has become kind of a buzzword of the 90s. Well, globalization was a buzzword of the 1890s as well. And, and the 1890s is huge, but what happens after World War II really is critical. I mean, if you want to look at the globalizing world, the, the current round of corporate globalization, I mean, you have to at least start back at, at, in this period, especially at Bretton Woods, which really creates for the first time the, the supranational the transnational institutions which are going to facilitate this globalizing uh, mission. Uh, at Bretton Woods, the, the real brains behind Bretton Woods were actually two British uh, economists, one of whom you should be familiar already, Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, the others, anybody know? Harry Dexter White, actually Harry Dexter White was American. Keynes and Harry Dexter White are kind of the brains behind Bretton Woods. It, it's a uh, a, a conference to design a liberal economic order. They want to create a liberal world order, right? To avoid what had happened in the 20s, right? So they all get together, 40 some countries, and they create two institutions at Bretton Woods. The IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank, which is officially known as the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. These are important and controversial bodies. They were then, they are now. The principles behind Bretton Woods are to behind Bretton Woods are to create a stable global economic order based on free trade. They want international monetary cooperation with international agencies defining what the global economy will look like and who will dominate these international agencies, who will put the most money in, who will have the most votes, who will have the most influence, who do you think? D.C., Washington, D.C. will. So they want to have this international cooperation. They want to maintain high levels of investment capital by creating international banking regulations that will facilitate that and global banks, okay? to facilitate that. If you need a loan, you go to these institutions, right? So you can create and maintain large capital flows that way. They want a system of unhindered trade and convertible currencies. They want trade without barriers and cur currency convertibility. What's that mean? And you don't even know what it means. Why is it important? You want convertible currencies. Why? Because you can trade easier. That's, it's simple. You know, if you can trade uh, uh, dollars for marks or dollars for francs, all right, without, uh, 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 and what's that based on, by the way? What, what would you have to have that based on? Hmm? Gold. Gold, right? It's, it's a fixed system, all right? You have currency convertibly based on a fixed, it just makes trade much easier, right? Uh, a pound is worth, I don't know what it is after World War II. Um, I know in, it was $2.80 in 1967, so somewhere between 280 and 440. But if, if you have a system in which you know what a pound is worth, and our trade, you know, it's, a, it's like buying a Saturn, right? You don't haggle, you don't negotiate. You just go in and you know what it costs, right? So basically the idea there is if we have fully convertible currencies based on a fixed system, then you know, it will facilitate trade. Um, it will be based on a gold system to avoid the wild fluctuations that could take place otherwise, right? And, um, and we'll also try to maintain equilibrium in something called the balance of payments system. Balance of payments is what you spend overseas. It's money spent, military spending, if we have a bunch of American troops in Germany, that's an American deficit, right? Because you have to pay these people in American dollars, all right? So that's a deficit, that money is going overseas. American tourism money is a balance of payment deficit because Americans spend money overseas, all right? American investment is a deficit, it's money being spent overseas, all right? Now, sometimes balance payments deficit is not such a bad thing because it in increases uh, economic activity, kind of primes the economic pump. 
uh, so to speak. But at the same time, if you get too far out, if you get the if the if the disequilibrium becomes too great, then that will affect economic activity, right? If you have a massive uh, 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 deficit in the amount of money going out, and you're not bringing in as much, then this can cause uh, 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 currency revaluations, could cause inflation, cause all kinds of problems like that. So. Basically, this is a long-winded way of making the very simple point that I started with, which was that Bretton Woods' goal was to create global economic stability based on free trade. The IMF's particular purpose is to stabilize world currencies. All right? In the 30s, one of the major reasons for the Depression was that currencies depreciated and fluctuated wildly because all of these countries were still carrying over their debts from World War I, and remember trade had gone down so much, that massive contraction in world trade, so that exchange rates were current, constantly fluctuating and trade was diminished. Now with, with flu uh, currency fluctuations occurring you know, on a regular basis, that makes trade even more difficult. All right. So they want to avoid that, and the IMF is funded at 7.3 billion dollars, a significant amount of money. The IMF is goal. The IMF's goal is to make loans available. The IMF is a lending institution. All right. If a country has a huge balance of payments, deficit, if the money leaving that country in the form of military spending or tourism or investment is too great, then they can go to the IMF and say, we have a massive balance of payments deficit, which is affecting our home economy. Can you loan us some money? All right. If your currency is in crisis, there's a wild run on your currency. This happened in the 90s with the ruble, with the peso, and with the baht. Right? Um, in, in Thailand, then uh, 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 the, I, uh, the, the uh, IMF can say, yes, we can loan you money so you can stabilize your currency. It's a massive infusion of cash. So you don't have to de devalue or you don't have even wild or bounce payments or you don't have outside banks. You know, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of these countries are beholden to outside banks. They could call in their loans, right? So the IMF's goal is to avert economic crisis with massive infusions of cash. Right? So if a, cur a country finds itself with a, a, a currency crisis or unable to pay its debts or control its currencies, it can go to the IMF and say, we need loans, we need help, we're in trouble. All right? And what else does this do? If you have stable currencies, you can do what? It's the most important thing. St trade. Keep that in mind. It's like the underpinning of all this. It's kind of the underpinning of all this trade. Stable currencies lead to better trade. You promote exchange, uh, stability, and convertibility, and therefore facilitate trade. The goal here, above all else, is stability, to maintain global economic stability. All right. Now, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. I mean, there, there, are, there are conditions attached to this. This isn't a handout. This isn't charity work. But let me first talk about the, the World Bank, because I think that's important, too. The World Bank was officially known as the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. The IMF deals with money. The IMF is an institution based on currency, money. The World Bank is based on development, all right? The World Bank makes country money, makes funds available, uh, especially after World War II to, to all the countries that had been wiped out in Europe. Reconstruction, the International Bank of Reconstruction, and development to third world countries as well. The World Bank's goals are to establish industry, to, and this is a quote from them, to promote private investment. I'm going to come back and talk about that. To promote the long-range balanced growth of international trade. All right? These are, these are the, the stated goals in the, in the World Bank Charter. To promote private investment, to promote long-range balanced growth of international trade. The World Bank was capitalized at 9.1 billion, of which over a third was funded by the Americans, and it was authorized to lend at twice that amount. In addition, the World Bank always has what kind of person as president? What do all the presidents of the World Bank have in common? They're Americans. Robert McNamara was president of the World Bank for a while after he left the Pentagon. Now, this is what's important. Okay? So far, you can see what the American interest is in a larger globalizing sense, right? Creating economic stability. That's good for the United States. But it's even more specific than that. The World Bank and the IMF, the Bretton Woods system, essentially becomes, I call it kind of the Tony Soprano shakedown. It's a way to help your friends and hurt your enemies, all right? Support from either institution. 
an IMF loan or a World Bank loan are conditioned upon the requirement that aid be channeled through whom? Take a gander. Well, we'll be the U.S., but even more that private companies, all right? If you have a state-run communication system or a state run banking system or a state run transportation system all right what's the IMF or the World Bank going to tell you can't do can't do anything for you right the money has to go through private investments why because then American companies can get their cut if you go through private corporations and not states then American corporations will have guaranteed access to markets and resources. And isn't that vital if you're going to avoid what had happened after World War I? So if a nation seeks aid from the IMF or from the World Bank, it has to work with American banks, with American reconstruction companies, with American industries, thereby guaranteeing American economic activity, American profits. You want World Bank money to build a, 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 you know, a telecommunications system it's not going to be state run you know you would have to you get that money but as part of the deal you have to engage private companies the brown and roots of the world or the you know AT&T's of the world or, or, or whatever so it's a way to guarantee markets and investment for American companies in the same way if a country doesn't have that type of open private economic system what happens to them do they get access to the IMF and the World Bank no they don't so if you have, let's say, a, 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 well, kind of to, to, to kind of step back a bit, let's say a country has a, a, a balance of payments or, or a currency stabilization crisis, currency valuation crisis. They go to the IMF and say, we need money. We need an infusion of cash, all right? The IMF doesn't simply say, okay, and write the check out and hand it to them, right? It says a lot of things, like Bob Dylan's father it says a lot of things. Um, it says, uh, first, this has to go through private channels, which I just mentioned. But more than that, it says, you have to engage in certain practices. If we're going to give you this kind of money, you have to change your economy. Okay? For one thing, you have to start getting cash. And how do you get cash? What's, if, what's a, if a national economy needs to bring in cash, what does it have to do? Hmm? But even more than that, what? Mm, export. Exports. All right, so the first thing the IMF is going to tell is you need to develop a more export-oriented economy, all right? Now, this means that, that if you have a system in which your workers are guaranteed uh, health care or uh, minimum wages, all right, that may have to go because that's money that would need to be pumped in to an export-oriented economy. It means that if you have uh, 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 subsidies or quotas on lumber growing, those have to go because you need to export as much lumber or coffee or whatever as possible. So basically the IMF will come in and say, you have to change your domestic practices in order to develop an economy that brings cash in. You have to export as much as you can. You have to cut social programs because that's money that's going to people instead of to foreign exchange. Right? You want to pay your debts, goodbye minimum wage, goodbye health care, goodbye social safety net. Now if a country refuses to do that, and most notably, who would that be? Who's not, who doesn't operate that way? Whose economies don't, aren't, aren't structured that way in, in 1945? The Eastern European countries. So what does that mean to them? Do they have access to the IMF and World Bank? No. So the IMF and World Bank, it's a, that's why I say it's a strategy for hegemony. I think in, in terms of winning the Cold War, if the U.S. won the Cold War, if the West won the Cold War, if you believe that, this is why. It's not because of Reagan or because of the Berlin Airlines. It's because of the money. There's a great line about the, uh, I can't remember, it's a little poem basically about you know, all the money bags and the brains. But that's what ultimately is far more decisive than anything that takes place on a battlefield. It's the creation of these institutions from which the United States, by virtue of having the most overwhelming economy in the world, can call the shots. At the end of World War II, the U.S. controls over 50% of the world's trade. 6% of the population, over 50% of the world's trade. Right? 
So that's a level of hegemony that's really, really, really hard to contend with. And when you have these institutions, which the U.S. can control, like the Monetary Fund, like the World Bank, basically using money here to help your allies, to hurt your enemies, to guarantee market shares and jobs and resources and access to American corporations, it's real hard to put a dent in that kind of a system. And so, uh, uh, you know, the Americans do a great job of that. In addition to that, they create the World Bank, they create the IMF. In addition to that, the third leg of this, which is just as important, is they create a global currency system. They establish a global system with the dollar as the world's currency, which means that all over the world, the dollar is the accepted medium for trade. Now, if you can get your currency established as the global currency for trade, you can imagine what that does for the American economy, all right? means everybody wants dollars. In addition to that, how do you back that up? You create a global convertibility with gold. If you have an ounce of gold, wherever you bring it, they have to give you 35 American dollars. It will remain that way until uh, August of 1971, I think, when Nixon finally kills the Bretton Woods system. So, if you want to trade, you can always trade with dollars. And if you have gold, they have to give you dollars. And even better than that, since it's a fixed system, you can trade your money for dollars, right? If if a, a pound sterling is 280, then you can bring in 10 pounds of uh, uh, you know 10 a 10 pound sterling note or whatever and get what was it 28 dollars right you have to do that and then you use that for trading it's a fixed system dollars are the global and convertible currency so think of this the united states has established a system in which it determines who gets loans it determines how those loans have to be spent it will determine which corporations are the beneficiaries of that loans and all of the trade has to be conducted in what currency the dollar okay it's real hard not to have global economic predominance when you've established it that way. Britain doesn't. Britain doesn't have a whole lot of choice. And Britain wants to maintain the, the sterling block, right? They can. I mean, the, the world has passed them by. Uh, for developing countries, it, you know, it makes some sense. I mean, it gives them access to money. Uh, the lure, the seduction of this is, is quite great. No, the British were never huge fans. I mean, it's actually Keynes' system. It's what Keynes wanted to do after World War I, a free trade area of Europe. Basically, you know, Keynes and Wilson, these guys are liberals. This is a very liberal system. The idea, well, it's kind of liberal, except that whole free trade thing. You know, these are guaranteed. These are also, you know, state guarantees. Uh, it's kind of ironic, isn't it, that, like, if a, if a state... Uh, wanting IMF or World Bank money has a subsidized uh, coffee economy, let's say. Let's say they're paying their coffee growers, they're subsidizing them. Right? Uh, the IMF can simply say, no, you can't do that. You have to remove those subsidies if you want aid from us. At the same time, this is money that they're guaranteeing to American corporations by virtue of it having to go through private and not state-oriented uh, companies. Uh, even today, if you look at uh, uh, the data on protectionist uh, tariffs, uh, the industrialized world uh, uh, on any, in any given year has about $300 billion worth of tariffs. So at the same time, they're uh, creating these you know, institutions like NAFTA or CAFTA, uh, which, which allegedly are supposed to liberalize trade. They have far more protection, protectionist measures than anybody else combined, the U.S. and the British and the, and the big, the big e economies do. All right. So um, at Bretton Woods then, they create the IMF, they create the World Bank, they create a gold standard with the American dollar as a universal and convertible currency. You can always trade an ounce of gold for 35 US dollars. All trade will be conducted in dollars and the US is bound to accept gold and pay out dollars to any country. So the Bretton Woods system is, is it, man, it's the bomb. It creates the mechanism for post-war economic power, all right? I mean, I'm trying to, I, I think this is pretty easy. I don't think this is like a bunch of economics hocus pocus because economists tend to talk a lot of junk and it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And they talk about variables and flow charts and all that. This is an alchemy. It's really pretty easy. I mean, the way economics works is kind of like, I mean, the idea of gold is alchemy. Why peg gold? I mean, you could pick, you know, a, a pen, you know, it's just gold, right? So they peg gold as a global, global uh, e economic uh, uh, currency. But at the same time, it's not really that hard to figure out. By subsidizing 
and stabilizing, which is the key word, currency and reconstruction, channeling it through what kind of corporations? Mostly, mostly American corporations, and making the dollar the world's currency. The U.S. makes sure at Bretton Woods that global commerce will be free. And by free, what do they mean? Freedom isn't free, we often hear. It means free commercial enterprise. Free enterprise at Bretton Woods mean that America and American corporations and their subsidiaries will control global trade, not competing systems. The USSR, the Soviet Union was at Bretton Woods, but never joined the IMF or World Bank. Were the Soviet Union, was the Soviet Union going to agree to privatization? Was the Soviet Union going to open its books to the West and, you know, so that they could analyze the Soviet economy? Of course not. All right. America's economic strength in the post-war era is due to this as much as anything, okay? This Bretton Woods system. We're going to talk a lot. I mean, the IMF is going to be, in the 90s, the IMF is going to resurface kind of a, a bet noir for, for the world, especially for, for the developing world, for the global left, for the anti-globalization movement. I mean, it's still around. It's still very powerful. It's still very potent. Right? And other institutions like the WTO or NAFTA really kind of emerge out of the, the framework that was established at Bretton Woods with the IMF. I, I get kind of, in, in this part of, I'm sure it's the historian in me, but I, I, I do a lot of globalization work. And it always starts, you know, when you go to these things, people always start like in, a, in a November of 1999 in Seattle, when all of a sudden, boom, you know, 80,000 people showed up in Seattle to protest. And, you know, I think it's really kind of a disservice because if you really want people to understand this, you, you need to kind of put it in a much larger framework because it's actually way worse than the WTO in 1999 Seattle. That's nothing. This is really, this is really the guts of it. And it's, you, you really need to start, I think, at Bretton Woods when these institutions are created, because they really do create American economic hegemony. All right. Any questions? I've either like totally confused you, or explained it in such clarity that you understand it in ways that you never imagined. Well, no. Um, Nixon gutted it. Nixon took the U.S. off the gold standard in '71. We don't have. We have floating currencies now. Yeah. No, uh, the the Larouche people are kind of funny. They're, they we we have a long and firm relationship, me and them. Uh, um, Nixon um, took the U.S. off the gold standard in August of 71. Um, I mean, the IMF and World Bank are still around, and they're still very potent and very powerful. Uh, not, not, I mean, the, the U.S. doesn't have the same power it did in 1945, right? So, so it's not quite as dominated as it was. But the real issue is the, the, gold, the, the dollar and gold. Now, we now have floating currencies. So, I mean, the, the dollar's pegged against, now the euro is, is really kind of starting to rival the dollar. I mean, uh, a euro and dollar started even. I believe when the euro first came on the market, it was a dollar, wasn't it? it was, I think it was one to one, and now a euro is a, a buck 28. So the euro's gaining in value, getting, getting stronger and stronger, yeah. Yeah, they're called SDP, structural, SAP, structural adjustment programs, yeah. Yeah, I mean, actually, the, the lumber example I gave was from Indonesia in 97, because Indonesia was forced to basically wipe out a lot of forests to uh, increase its export earnings so it could get cash, so it could get cu uh, currency. I would have said dollars, but, you know, not necessarily. But uh, no, I mean, the biggest, the biggest abandonment of Bretton Woods is, is that you now have floating currencies, which is a lot harder for me. I, I study this, and it's pretty easy. I mean, if you're going to study economics, this is the period to study it in, because all you need to know is how to like, multiply 35 times 1. You know, it's, it's $35, one ounce of gold, and basically have very little converse, con currency convertibility or fluctuation. Britain in late 67, for instance, devalues the pound from 280 to 240. I mean, that's like one devaluation. And, you know, in the 20s and 30s, they were devaluing every day. So it's, it's a pretty easy system. And, I mean, it creates stability. You always know what's out there. You know that your currency is going to be worth this amount, and it ain't going to change. So long as you have $35, you can buy an ounce of gold. So long as you have gold, you can trade it for dollars. So long as you have dollars, anybody in the world, it's like the, you know, don't go home without it. It's like the, what is the American Express card or the Visa card or whatever. Everybody's going to take a dollar. Everybody's going to take gold. So it's really a stable system.
Nixon guts that for a lot of reasons. And it gets more complicated. I mean, it's a lot easier to understand this than the floating system today, which, you know, often gives me headaches. Yeah. All right. Okay. Economic hegemony. Political hegemony. Part two. The United Nations. And I can go through this fairly quickly. I think you're fairly familiar with it. The U.S. wants to create the U.N. Why? For all these lofty goals of creating a better world, peace, prosperity, one world government. We'll all hold hands and release doves and everyone's going to get along, right? Um, I think it's always funny because the U.N., if you ever listen to especially some of these wacko radio shows, you know, they're talking about the blue hats and the, the U.N. is going to come in and take over. And the U.S., you know, uh, people file lawsuits when the U.S. participates in U.N. operations because, you know, it's a violation of the American Constitution and it's one world government and it's socialist and you have all these kind of right-wing conspiracy nuts. The U.N., and what's and, and, and you know what's amazing about this? It Brent Woods in the same ways. These were institutions set up for American power, and they worked well. You know, so all these kind of like hyper patriotic Americans don't even understand that these institutions are doing their work for them, and they criticize them. It's it's really kind of ironic. You know, um, the UN and the Brent Wood and Brent Woods are really critical. They're, that's that's the kind of one two punch: economic hegemony, political. Hegemony. The United Nations does that. Um, the UN, obviously, much like the League of Nations uh, 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 after World War I, the U.S. creates the UN according to its needs. The Soviet Union's there, like they were at Bretton Woods, but the U.S. has far more power and is able ultimately to create the UN according to its needs. They set up the institution to have a powerful Security Council. Who's on the Security Council in 1945? The U.S. is, the French, the British, the U.S. and Britain, Soviet Union. China and France are the interesting ones, right? Because France, you know, clearly had been defeated in World War II and was called into question. And China, which we'll talk about later, was really, uh, I mean, uh, really in bad shape, you know, ready to fall. So, uh, 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 so clearly then the Security Council, I mean, is, is a U.S. body. There's only one country on there which, you know, with which it doesn't have really strong relations, and that's the Soviet Union. And I mean, to get, to get the Chinese government, we'll talk more about that, the Chinese government was really corrupt and beleaguered. It was led by somebody named Zhang Zhixi, Chiang Kai-shek. And to get the Chinese on the Security Council, and for the British to get the French on the Security Council, really were statements about how powerful the West was vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was pissed off in both of those cases, uh, uh, and uh, the only reason they agreed to that is because the UN Security Council also included a veto uh, measure uh, where you can veto a proposal, you know, so basically if not, Stalin's going to get ganged up four to one most of the time, right? Um, in fact, that was there was even a question as to how to use the veto. The U.S. actually um, believed that uh, 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 that countries who were a party to a dispute should not be allowed to veto it. And Stalin, of course, said that's ridiculous, and he wouldn't go for that. So. Um, uh, uh, the veto was kind of Stalin's salvation. In fact, um, membership in the General Assembly was also a, a, at play. Uh, if you know anything about the Soviet Union, the old Soviet Union, it's still hard for me not to call it that. Uh, it, was all, it was the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. There were actually 16 republics in the Soviet Union. Stalin went in and said, I want 16 votes in the UN, one for each republic. And of course the West said no. And, you know, and it sounds funny, right? We laugh, oh, he wanted 16 votes. But he said, well, Guatemala, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras, Mexico, Belize, Panama, and he lists, he says, you know, the Monroe Doctrine. The U.S. has that many votes from, from Latin America, you know, those are, those are dead ringers, so, um, so, uh, but, but of course he didn't get it. Um, the U.N. Charter basically is set up as a power document. Uh, the UN through the General Assembly, which is clearly dominated by the United States, votes on measures. The Security Council has ultimate power. It's only the veto, which the U.S. actually wanted to take away. The U.S. wanted to create a set of, of uh, uh, issues which would be removed from veto, and of course the Soviet Union didn't go along with that. Um, 
Uh, there was a, a lot of people said there was an American steamroller effect going on. Uh, the UN Charter, uh, for instance, called for the liberation of colonial areas, but uh, said that Britain and France could retain their colonial possessions. Uh, one of the uh, ranking American officials there said that uh, we will have our cake and eat it too. So clearly then the UN, like the uh, 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 Bretton Woods system, is, is a way for the United States to assert its dominance. Questions uh, of, of global dispute will come to the UN. The UN has far more power, all right? Uh, uh, one of the uh, critiques of the right wing has often been, well, you know, if you look at the UN, the Soviet Union was always vetoing stuff, you know? And in the first 30 or 40 years before, uh, about the first 25 years or so, yeah, the, the Soviet Union did have way, way, way more vetoes than the US. Why was that? It was a, that, was a, that was all they could do, right? They were overwhelmingly outnumbered, right? Uh, since then, it's obviously flip-flopped around. If you look at like uh, uh, anything regarding Israel, I mean, the vote's usually 117 to two, right? It's the US and Israel, you know, sometimes another country. Uh, and the US is actually now vetoing measures left and right. Uh, because kind of the global balance of power has shifted a bit, all right? So uh, this, is, this is what happens at the end of the war. Um, the United States has kind of, you know, creates this system now uh, uh, with Bretton Woods and with uh, um, the United Nations, which really kind of set it up. So by 1945, in the aftermath of Yalta and Poland and Bretton Woods and the UN conference, I mean, the U.S. is set to create this new liberal open door world. It has overwhelming power. It hasn't been terribly badly hurt by the war. I mean, the Soviet Union loses, you know, 40 million, who knows, 25, 40 million people. The U.S. loses 300,000. The Soviet Union has 70,000 villages, 40,000 miles of railway, a million farms and factories destroyed. The U.S. has zero, really, right? So this overwhelming power, the dollar is the world's currency, 50% of the world trade, you know, the U.S. is set to go, ready to kind of take on uh, uh, the world, all right? Any questions? Start this, this uh, make some progress here. All right. This is actually, in a sense, a, a prologue. This is kind of like a background to the Cold War. But you have to do it because it really does kind of set into motion this whole idea. You know, as I said before, I mean, the real debate over the Cold War, one of the real debates over the Cold War is who did it? You know, what was it about? And Americans, liberal and conservative alike, the vast majority of Americans, you know, said Stalin's crazy, you know? I mean, uh, uh, he's gone into Eastern Europe, he's trying to take over, he's established these uh, areas of uh, occupation all over the place, so, um, you know, you can't really trust the guy, right? So, um, let me see if I have a, yeah, what should I do? Post-war map here. If we can get a shot at that or not. Yeah, let me see, zoom. There we go. All right. This purple part, blue, purple, however it shows up in your Eastern Europe. All right. This is the Soviet Union, and this is the area they occupy. You know, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland. All right. Yugoslavia is independent, but it's also communist. Eastern Germany, part of Austria actually, is occupied after the war. So the, the American-centric argument says, you know, look at, look at all this purple. Um, Stalin clearly was on an aggressive crusade to create communism all over the continent, maybe all over the world. He was just like Hitler. Right? It was the new Hitler. And he had to be stopped in the most aggressive and forceful way possible. And so anything that the U.S. did was actually a defensive response to the Soviet Union. Conversely, the leftist argument would be the United States was trying to extend global hegemony through institutions like the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank or, or, or the U.N. And uh, the Soviet Union stood in the way uh, in a vital area. Okay, so these are kind of, you know, a couple of the important ways of looking at this. If you read the piece that I, I wrote that I assigned like in week one, it talks a lot about that, 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 you know, what happened to the new left. It talks a lot about the way historians have looked at this as well. The dominant view clearly, and especially within official circles, was that the Soviet Union was hell bent on empire, on taking over everything. And so uh, uh, the U.S. had to contain that, had to, to stop that, all right? And so while the war is still going on, 
the U.S. is taking measures to assert itself. All right. Um, once the war ends, the alliance falls apart fairly quickly. Um, I, I really don't think it could have actually survived, given given the nature of global politics. It would have been hard to imagine it surviving anyway. And clearly, uh, in the immediate aftermath, things go go south very quickly. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about American and Soviet goals. And this is going to be something we've talked about before. There is a, clearly a difference uh, in the way that the countries look at the world. Um, in the United States, what's the American goal? We know that. It's, it's a liberal world. It's an open door world. Trade and investment without um, state subsidies, uh, without tariffs, without barriers. Uh, you know, free trade and, and liberal investment policies, all that kind of stuff. And in such a system, the U.S. would naturally do well because it had a big economy. Um, the real risk to that, what they saw in the 30s especially, was that some countries might try to close off particular areas to outside commerce. Germany and Japan, economic nationalism. This is a real fear. This is a real fear especially by policymakers who lived through the Depression. In fact, the American Assistant Secretary of State, a guy named Dean Acheson, whose name is up there, Acheson's prescription, uh, was very candid about this. In 1944, he, he testified publicly before Congress, and he said, we cannot go through another 10 years, right, like we did before, like the Depression of the 30s and 40s. We cannot go through another 10 years like that without having the most far-reaching consequences upon our economic and social systems. My contention is that we cannot have full employment and prosperity in the United States without the foreign markets. This is Dean Acheson speaking. Acheson is one of the wise men. He's one of the, the godfathers of the American empire of the Cold War. Acheson said America's greatest challenge wasn't fighting the Soviet threat, wasn't fighting communism, wasn't fascism. America's greatest challenge is finding markets. America's greatest challenge is finding markets. The United States has unlimited creative energy. The important thing is markets. We can produce more goods all the time. That's not a problem. We can make new stuff. We can be creative. We can make better stuff, but we have to find markets. Why? Not only because they're essential for economic growth, but because with markets we can maintain America's political system, America's democracy. Without outside markets, the United States could develop a rigid state economy with production and consumption done at home. But who did that? Who just tried that? The, the, the Germans and the Japanese tried that, right? And, and look what happened. That's an economically nationalist system. And Atchison says, if we do that, we will betray the Constitution, undermine our conceptions of liberty and private property. Because if you want to have a closed economic system like that, you're probably going to have a closed political, an autocratic political, an authoritarian political system as well, like Germany and like, like Japan did. So Atchison says, He's not, is he talking about communism? Is he saying the real challenge is that we might go communist? Eh, is not, there's no chance in hell of the U.S. <clears throat> developing any kind of like socialist economy, despite criticisms of the New Deal. I mean, the New Deal was, was an attempt to, to salvage capitalism because it was, it was damaged, right? Ashes is not saying if we don't fix it up, the, the, it's going to be the socialists, they're going to have their way, and oh, we're all going to be, you know, marching in May Day parades, and we're going to have pictures of Emma Goldman on our walls. And they're not saying that. The threat, as far as Atchison is concerned, is it just develops a fascist, a corporatist state economy. That's the alternative. That's the alternative. And without, so, without markets, without global commerce, without the open door, what Atchison is saying is that the U.S. faces not just the economic distress, but political crisis. All right? And we started talking about this at the beginning, this idea that, that liberalism, imperialism, capitalism need free institutions in order to grow, to, to develop. That doesn't mean you have New England town meetings. It, it may mean that you have a facade of democracy, in fact. And one could clearly make that point. It doesn't mean you redistribute power and wealth. God knows that's not going to happen. But it means you avoid an autocratic, a closed, autarkic, economically nationalist system.
that you have to avoid. That's the real fear, not communism. I mean, if you go through, and, and I'm just using this as an example, none of these guys are saying, we might go communist. No one is saying that. Even in the 30s, during the Depression, which essentially, as far as the left was concerned, proved the ultimate crisis of capitalism, the Americans weren't concerned about being red. That's a wonderful device to round people into shape. Oh, no, the communists are coming. You know, you better give up your rights. McCarthyism, you know, COINTELPRO, Patriot Act. It's a wonderful device. But in the real world, that wasn't the, the concern. The challenge and the concern were avoiding economic nationalism, was fascism, was corporate it wasn't the left, right? And so a global open door becomes the sine qua non, you know, the, the essential ingredient in America's uh, 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 post-war formulation, right? And this, I mean, you know that. I mean, that's, that's something we've talked about. But keep in mind, Atchison's prescription, which is markets, open door, with Bretton Woods. You see how they fit together? You see how they fit together? That's not a coincidence. These guys talk to each other. Their brains work in, in kind of synthetic ways. Atchison often said, you know, people don't think like a, like a, you know, a, a dairy, you know, farm where you have, you know, kind of the fat that's taken away from the milk and everything. You know, people don't do that. You don't separate these things. You think in kind of a homogenous way where everything comes together. Ashton's talking about trade. He also understands currency. He understands what's happening in Bretton Woods. He understands convertibility. All of these things are ways for the U.S. to maintain this incredibly privileged standard of living, as well as maintain global imperium for American corporations. British and Soviet aims are different. Again, not surprising. They're more traditional. They're rooted in the established traditions of imperialism and old Europe. Churchill still wants to hold on to as much of the empire as possible as much as he understands that the U.S. wants to get into the colonial areas in search of the open door. Churchill also wants to maintain the British role in Europe. In Europe, traditionally, countries had uh, carved out areas of interest, right? In fact, this is really illustrated. Churchill and Stalin both believed the same way. They actually had a lot more in common than either did with the U.S. on this issue. Uh, 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 the Soviet Union clearly doesn't believe in free trade in the open door, does it? It's a communist system. It wants to, to have a communist economy, you know. Uh, the British are, are old imperialists in the Sterling bloc, so they don't believe in the open door either, although they're clearly more uh, 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 structured in a way to, to work along with it, and I think they're better resigned to the idea that that's what's going to happen anyway. Nonetheless, in October of 44, while the war is still going on, Churchill and Stalin get together, and, and they wrote down the names of all the Balkans countries, Greece, Albania, Bulgaria, and they attached numbers next to them, percentages as to which country would have the most power. So, for instance, uh, and this is in Churchill's memoirs, he writes on a piece of paper, Romania, Soviet Union 90 percent, Bulgaria, Soviet Union 75 percent, Greece, Britain 90 percent, Yugoslavia and Hungary 50-50. Basically, these two guys, Churchill and Stalin, are getting together and carving up the rest of Europe, right? You have Greece, I get Hungary. I get Poland, you get Romania, right? It's like kids throwing baseball cards around, you know. I'll give you a Mickey Mantle for a Willie Mays. I'll give you Greece, you take Yugoslavia. You know, I get Greece, you take... So, so this is the old way of doing things. Now, do the United States believe in this? No, not for any particular moral or political reasons, because that's not the way the market operates. The market has to have free and unfettered commerce as much as possible, especially in these areas because they're rich in raw materials and markets. I mean, they're fairly developed compared to the rest of the world, certainly far more developed in Asia or Latin America or Africa would be. So you can sell stuff in Yugoslavia and Greece. You can sell stuff in the Balkans. You can get raw materials in the Balkans. You can get labor from the Balkans. And it's a rich area. You don't want it carved up 90%, 50% BS. No, those areas are free and they are part of the open door. That's the U.S. goal. So the British and Soviet Union is quite different on that. In addition to that, the British uh, are, are kind of in an economic quandary. The war is incredibly expensive. And as in World War I, the British borrowed a lot of money to pay for it. Who did they borrow from? The United States. And they'll have to keep borrowing, uh, 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 you know, as well. Uh, this creates grave economic problems. The British basically say, we fought the war. We fought the Battle of Britain. We were there the whole time. And now the Americans are gouging us, right? 
it's it's kind of like you know World War One, right? You know, uh, remember what Clemenceau said? Wilson bought his his place at the at the at the peace table at a, at a bargain at a discount. Uh, uh, Keynes refers to this as Britain's financial Dunkirk. Remember the the massive escape at Dunkirk, right? Um, he said uh, uh, the financial problems of the war have been surmounted, you know, easily, but the post-war problems are far graver. Uh, and in fact, Keynes is sent. To uh, uh, to the Americans to 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 negotiate a new loan, um, the Americans give Britain at the end of the war a 3.7 billion dollar loan. All right, spread over 50 years. Uh, the Americans think you know Britain is actually a rival, so we shouldn't help them out. And the British say, "Damn, how can you do this to us? We just fought this war next to you." All right. Um, so uh, uh, the British are quite upset about that. In addition to that, Bretton Woods said, remember, that the dollar was the world's currency and all other currencies are convertible. What does that do to the, st the, the sterling block? Britain can't control it anymore. It breaks up in the sterling block, doesn't it? I mean, basically, this is how Britain gets decolonized. It's 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 kind of I mean they, you know you've seen Gandhi and you've you've know, heard all these you know these these great you know stories but at the same time Britain is basically decolonized because it it can't have the sterling block anymore sterling is convertible now to dollars all right so um, all of this is taking place all right and the British find themselves now kind of as a country in decline uh, uh, you know because the United States has so much global power. Um, and Keynes is aware of that. Uh, Keynes is aware that Britain is in decline. At one point, he kind of makes a funny little metaphor, which he often did. He says, uh, uh, um, that he's talking about the American, uh, American aid and the American loan, and he says, it'll build up a separate economic block, which excludes Canada and consists of countries to which we already owe more than we can pay on the basis of their agreeing to lend us money that we have not got and only buy from us and one another goods that we are unable to supply. So this is how kind of Keynes looks at Britain. It doesn't have money, it's in debt, it's borrowing money from people it can't repay and it really can't produce the goods that it needs to sell. All right. So the British find themselves, you know, kind of looking at the world, uh, uh, you know, w with with a real sense of loss. Th their days are, are kind of uh, uh, numbered. The Soviet Union's goals are different. On one hand, we can say, well, they wanted security, but that was always harder to discern. However, in the last several years, especially since '91, when everything kind of fell apart in the Soviet Union, a lot of these old records have come out. A lot of people who can read and speak Russian have gone to the Soviet Union, and they've gotten access to a lot of these things that no one had known even existed prior to that. And so for the last 10 or 12 years, we're starting to see translations of all these uh, Soviet uh, uh, documents. Uh, if the traditional um, uh, story was that the Soviet Union was aggressive and the United States had to respond to preserve free institutions, then we now know that there's a lot more to it than that. In fact, Soviet thinking is quite clear, quite developed, and, and we can look at these Soviet analyses now and figure out what they were thinking, which we will do at the beginning of next class.